we're going to go to Dick Esterly now. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Dick Esterly, and um, thanks for coming and allowing me to be part of this. Um, I've known John since 1993 as a result of the uh, New York Times article uh, where there was a picture of him sitting in his office among his models. And um, it, it was a very happy picture. And as a result, I called. I needed to talk to him about some models I was working on. And um, so I called the math department at Princeton. I said, can I talk to John Conway? He said, well, he's not in his office. I said, well, could I leave a message? I go, well, he won't answer it. I said, well, could I write him a letter? He said, well, he won't look at it. And um, so I was a little stumped. They said, well, do you have email? I said, well, um, I guess I could get it. So that was the first email I got. And uh, I actually sent John an email and said, you know, can I show you my models? He said, sure, come on down. So that's when I met him and uh, we became entangled. Um, so then, uh, uh, so in the last six years, I've been living in New Jersey, and I've been able to see John um, fairly regularly as a result. And um, I last saw him on March 3rd, and we had a great day um, talking about stuff. And uh, he left me with the word tamesis. I don't know. You know how he liked to, to know words. Uh, uh, and <clears throat> he brought it up. We've been talking about British and American slang and how to uh, – uh, he loved to interject uh, four-letter words into uh, sentences and words, and uh, it kind of left me with the idea of uh, of how, just how he thought about numbers and, and math, and uh, it was a great, great day. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so I was going to say I always felt a little bit sad when I left John, and uh, now he's left us, so... Uh, what I'm going to do is show a video from April of 2018. Uh, I was going down to uh, the gathering for Gardner in Atlanta. And um, so I stopped by and I asked, you know, I videoed him. I asked him to remember Martin. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, he loved the, the gathering for Gardner and uh, he also loved Martin. So uh, it's a little bit over three minutes. And, um, after that, uh, it'd be about 10 seconds to just kind of think, and then the next speaker can go on. So uh, I'm going to share my screen here, and then I'm going to start this up. Let's see here. Here we go. We went out to um, a cheap restaurant in Dobbs Ferry, I think was the name of the place. Uh, you know, you, uh, sorry, Martin's address, and therefore also Charlotte's address, uh, was 10 Euclid Avenue, Hastings on Hudson, New York. A very nice address for a person interested in geometry and so on. <clears throat> anyway, we went to this restaurant uh, and um, then the waitress came and dealt the plates onto the table. The table was, you know, one of those things that's a rigid board two inches thick and um, so she dealt the plates onto the table and um, then Martin, as if it's a comment on this way of dealing the plates, picked up his plate and dropped his cutlery through it. The girl screamed because it was so surprising and so effective. Uh, and Martin looked around, has anything special happened? So then he picked up more cutlery and dropped it through the place. And then in the end, he, he sort of gave a sort of show off by picking up 10 knives, 10 forks, 10 spoons and so on, and dealing it right through the place onto the table beneath. Uh, 
as we were going out, I asked him how he did that. Martin had a sort of understanding that, I don't know how I can phrase this, but the normal convention that a magician's tricks are his own or something and are not to be revealed didn't quite apply to me and Martin. So I said, Martin, you must tell me how you did that. This was as we were going from the restaurant. And he said, um, yes, okay. Uh, uh, he said, uh, later, later, um, I will tell you that I wouldn't have done that trick if that restaurant had been a bit brighter. Well, he never told me how to do that damn trick. I'm really upset about that. Uh, and he's dead now. Martin, why are you dead? There are so many things I'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Dick. Appreciate that. We're going to do Cindy Lawrence next. If you're ready, Cindy. So, um, like many of you, I'm going to start out by sharing the story of when I first met John. And I was, uh, we decided to have a conference, a uh, MOVES conference in 2015, I think it was, honoring John and, and Richard and Ellen. And just before that, I was at the Bridges Conference in Baltimore, and I came across John and I went to say hello. Um, it was literally the Bridges Conference was ending one day and the MOVES conference was ending the next. And he immediately uh, gave me a few riddles designed to let me know how many daughters and sons he had. Um, and they were challenging and we walked through them and I see Gareth is there, um, nice to see you. And um, after a while, uh, I solved enough riddles to satisfy him and I, I got up to walk away and I said, I'll see you tomorrow. We were having a dinner for the honorees at the museum. And he said, tomorrow, what's tomorrow? And I said, well, it's the MOOCs conference and we're honoring you and, and, and Richard and Ellen and we're having dinner together tomorrow. And he said, oh dear, I, I forgot that. Uh, sit down. And I sat back down and he said, now, now pull your chair closer to me, come very close to me. So I came very close to him and he picked up his phone and he made a phone call. And I'm not sure who was on the other end. It might've been Diana. Um, and he said to whoever he was talking to, this is John Conway, and uh, I know we have plans to have dinner tomorrow night, but I've just met another woman, and I'll be having dinner with her tomorrow night. Goodbye. And he hung up the phone. And uh, that was my first meeting with John, which was very amusing. And I will um, try to share my screen now, because um, he did come to the conference. Let's see if this works. And hopefully you can all see this. So this was at the MOVES conference, and we were delighted to have all three of these giants who uh, unfortunately have all left us within the last year. Um, and, and John's involvement with the museum did not end with the MOVES conference. Um, it began there. This is an image from our first gallery show in the composite gallery featuring the Oaks brothers. And it turned out that some of their art was related to some of the work that John did. And so you can see John and Chaim and Joe Cohn and Jade Vinson all joined us for a panel discussion about the artwork. Um, and then we had another MOVES conference, this time featuring Percy Diaconis and Manjal Bhargava, and that was on the math of magic. And John came to that conference too, and although he wasn't one of the honorees that year, by popular demand, we brought him up to the stage and had a lovely conversation with the three of them. Um, and during that conference, John spent a lot of time talking with everyone, especially with kids. And out of that, uh, Manjal Bhargava had an idea, wouldn't it be great to bring John to the museum and have him just hold court in the museum and talk to the public and talk to anybody who came. And we thought that was a great idea, and, and that's what we did. But I want to share with you a, a really lovely uh, piece of artwork that Brahma Butler painted and, and gave to me based on what she saw at the MOVES conference. And you can see the looks on everybody's faces. And we're hearing a lot of people talk about what a wonderful and accomplished mathematician John was. 
But what I saw in John was somebody who really could speak to the general public and really engage people and engage kids. And that was, that was really special. While he was spending time visiting the museum, this went on for a number of weeks, uh, one fall, uh, my colleague Tim Nissen and I uh, had responsibility to take John over to a nearby hotel at the end of the day and bring him back the next morning. And I'll just share one other story, which is one morning it was uh, my turn to pick John up and I went to his hotel room and started knocking and there was no answer and knocked and knocked and knocked and started to get a bit worried about what might be wrong, whether he was okay. But eventually I made my way to the little uh, lounge they had in this hotel on the fourth floor. Um, and that's where I found John surrounded by hotel visitors. And he delightedly told me that he had discovered that this lounge had coffee 24 hours a day. It never closed and he didn't sleep much. And so he'd been sitting doing his doomsday uh, exercise and, and really entertaining the visitors from all over the world in this little hotel um, with what day of the week they were born on. Um, and my last, um, oh, and then after that, I should say, uh, we also featured John in a show that we had called What's So Funny About Math, where we featured a lot of cartoons and then had commentary. And many of you know that John really liked triangles. And so we paired a comment with him about triangles um, with this comic that had to do with triangles. But it was very fun hearing John tell the story about how he stole a library book from his, his school uh, about triangles and eventually several years later did give it back. Um, my last visit with John with Tim Nissen, my colleague, was not long before he passed um, in December. Tim and I would make it a habit to visit him periodically, um, not as often as we would have liked, but anytime we had business in New Jersey, we would stop and see John. And this day he was particularly well, and we were sitting in a lovely bright area in, in the place where he was living. And he just was sharp and, and humorful and just was really a very pleasant visit. And that's always the way I remember him. The one last thing that I want to mention is that a number of us who are working on the design of some new exhibits for the museum have already been talking about perhaps an exhibit that could honor John's memory. The only exhibit we have right now, the only person who's honored by exhibits in the museum right now um, is Martin Gardner. And we can't think of a, a more fitting person to have an exhibit in his honor. So if any of you have ideas, uh, please feel free to share them with us. And thank you very much. And I'm happy to go before my dear friend, Mark Mitten. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Cindy. Uh, Mark is next. Mark Mitten, are you ready to go? Yeah. All right, OK. Um, so uh, thank you very much, Bob, and, and everyone. It's really exciting to uh, remember our amazing friend, John. And um, I, you know, to everybody at BAM, I've only been to one of your meetings, but it's thanks to Elwin and uh, David Eisenbud and, and Rick Summer. And um, thank you for putting this on. Um, I, I loved all the comments and I have many ideas. Like the, the story that was just told last January, um, so I'm going to try to tell many little stories and I'll start my timer so I don't go too long. But um, first in response to that story, that was the story of, of Martin Gardner passing cutlery through a table, uh, uh, sorry, through a, plate, a dinner plate. And John had told me about that trick over many years. And I should explain, I don't belong here because I'm a magician. And I only met John through the gathering for Gardner and that whole community. And the whole, my whole relationship with John has been magical uh, because he's brought me into this whole other world of, of meeting all of you. And, and it's really changed my life. And um, I'm so grateful. And um, so, so actually at our last lunch with Cy Koshin and Joe Cohn and uh, Siobhan Roberts, uh, this was actually last January. And we went to his Tomo Sushi in Princeton and that story got mentioned. I happened to read a book from 1885 that had a related but different trick in it. And so John told that story of passing the, the knives through the plates and I was able to replicate that trick for him. 
And uh, it was quite exciting to actually show him that, that stunt. And I still have to confirm with Jim, who's, who's also here, if uh, I want to look up in Martin's library, his card index, to see his notes on this old book from 1885. Um, I met John, Stan Isaacs mentioned a puzzle, I think called the Conway Cube. I think that's the puzzle that I met John through. I was at a dinner at, with Mark Sedicati, who brought me to the Gathering for Gardener, and Tom Rogers, and John. And he gave this puzzle. And I, I looked at him do the puzzle. And being a magician and not a puzzle person, I was watching the way he was moving. And I saw something. And um, he gave me the puzzle. And I tried it for about a minute and a half. And I solved it. And, um, and then I passed it to Mark Sedicati and Tom Rogers, who are puzzle experts, and they both couldn't get the puzzle. And, and I, I'm a magician, so I kept my mouth shut, and I was very secretive, but I waited till after dinner, and I quietly said to John, um, I cheated, I, I saw your wrist turn, and I just replicated your action. And he smiled at me, and he said, everything counts. <laughs> and, uh, and it was quite wonderful. Uh, what, what Heim said is so true. Uh, being with John was like a, a play date. <laughs> he made you feel like a kid. And um, at, at Gathering for Gardener, I got to know his son, Gareth, um, who I'd already met through Diana at dinners in Princeton. And uh, we, we had great play sessions. In fact, one of our, my last time with him at his apartment was a big play date with Gareth and John. And we just played with a bunch of puzzles and uh, tricks. Um, I wanted to add a couple notes to the knots that have been mentioned by Tim Shu and uh, Richard. Um, okay, so let's see. All right. Oh. I hope you can see this. All right, I'll try to move slowly. Okay, so the first knot that Tim mentioned was this, which was a, a hunter knot, which is a, a, a magician's knot. The second one that Richard mentioned was really cool because that was John's variation, which is the one that makes the figure eight knot. So, and I'll do that again so it's nice and pretty. Try to go a little slower. There, and you get a nice pretty figure eight knot. But also John loved mystery. Martin told a story about another way to hold a rope with you know, hold on to both ends, and then like so, wait, sorry, I'll, I'm actually trying to look at the monitor, all right, like so, and, and just instantly tie a knot like so. And John never learned that way, but he would always have me do it for him. And that was amazing thing about John, is that not a, he loved knowing things, but he loved mysteries. And it's, as a magician, it's something that we always talked about. And in fact, Cindy mentioned the Oaks twins and a special session. And in that session, uh, Kepler's mistakes came up uh, on the panel after the Oaks twins at the math museum. And it was a special panel on the art of the Oaks twins. And John defended Kepler's right to be wrong. He, he, he said how important it was to him as a holder of new ideas, how confusing that was and how exciting it was for him to, um, to hold on to new ideas. But with that came this uh, strange feeling because you weren't ever actually sure whether or not it was right or wrong. Only time could tell. And it was a beautiful dis defense of the mis mysterious. Um, oh, so I, I realize I'm going over, but just one last story, which is on the game of life. Um, it took me about a uh, a year to learn the game of life from him. I wanted to learn how he originally thought of it, which was as a manipulated game at Cambridge where he played it for 18 months. And I carried a board and black and white tiddlywink pieces and seashells with me and he wouldn't play. I tried in every situation and he said that he wanted to play, but it was at that moves conference in 2015. It was actually at that picture that Cindy Lawrence showed us I rolled out the game board and Richard Guy was there. And the beautiful thing was he didn't feel really comfortable playing Game of Life until he saw Richard because Richard was the guy that checked every single one of his moves. And every state was so ambiguous, it's actually a kind of a scary thing to play the game in that way. 
So uh, anyway, it's the love of ministry. And one last open question. And by the way, this is just an exciting format, and maybe we should do it again to talk about open questions. Um, when I talked to him about the surreal numbers, I asked him about uh, what is the other space from zero to Cantor's infinity to the surreal infinity? There's some other space out there that's beyond that. What do you call that? And he said, that's the infinite game space. And I said, do you mean like combinatorial game theory? And he said, no, that's Elwin's language. Richard made sure that we use that. So if any of you know anything about the infinite game space and talk to John about that, I'd love to talk to you. But anyway, thank you very much, Bob and everyone. Thank you, Mark. That's, that's very fascinating. I've never heard that term infinite game space before. Maybe um, Aaron or someone knows more. So before we move on, I, I just need to point out that we're now coming up on three hours, and, uh, which is our expected length, and we're running quite a ways behind, but we're going to keep the session over keep the session open until everyone has spoken and then anyone who wants to speak after the scheduled speakers is, is welcome to say a few words. Um, next up we have Francis Foom. Are you ready? Yes. Hi. Um, am, I, am I on screen now? You're on. Right. Okay. Well, uh, so my name's Francis Fung and uh, John Conway had a truly life-changing impact on my life in several ways. I first saw John in 1988 when I was a high school student. I saw him give this Dressler lecture at Kansas State on audiological decay. And then I saw him again the next few years at the summer MAA math fests where he was, you know, he was a welcome presence. He was always regaling students like me with engaging topics like the penny tricks, the doomsday algorithms, the tangles. He gave a uh, lectures on combinatorial games. And I managed to follow him around enough like at the meetings that I ended up sitting with him and Richard Guy and Don Albers at one of those MAA dinners in Orono, Maine in 1991. And I chose this shirt, you know, to wear because I'm quite certain I've met John in it at least once uh, wearing this shirt. So I was sitting there at this dinner and they got to talking about the Earl Raymond Hedrick lectures that John was about to give the next day. And Don Albers, who was in charge of MAA publications, he said he wished they could get a book out of this. And they were like, well, if there were only someone who could be like a, a scribe or something. And, you know, me here sitting there in my teenage exuberance kind of eavesdropping, I go, well, I could do it. And if I recall, Don turned to John and was like, do you know this guy? And John kind of sized me up. He's like, you look vaguely familiar. And so he agreed to give it a go. And that's how I became the assistant for writing the central quadratic form, which turned into a Keras mathematical monograph. Uh, I end up as a graduate student at Princeton, and I spent many sessions working on the manuscript with him in his office, which is immortalized in that 1993 New York Times article, typing tech at that Sun workstation, which at the time was rigged up so whenever he tried to log in, he had to first get 10 days of the week correct, and sometimes he'd redo it if he wasn't happy with his time, so it could take a long time for him to log in. And that reminds me, as I'm thinking about that, if I recall correctly, he never learned how to touch type. So, you know, he would sit there writing his emails. He'd be hunting and pecking with like two fingers. And he was quite fast at it. Um, anyway, the book was published in 1997. And that was the year I got my PhD. And then I left academia to become a software engineer. So, you know, I saw John a few more times over the years when he came through nearby. And I got a chance to see a lecture of his. And, um, one nagging question I, in my mind, since I wasn't publishing math papers anymore, was whether my assisted by credit on the book, since I wasn't really a co-author, I really was more of that scribe, you know, I'm like, does that count as a link in the Erdős number graph? And I like, I, I was, I asked him one time when I got a chance after one of his talks and, and he was very, uh, you know, gracious about it. And I was very gratified when he said, yes, you can count that as a link. So I, I was real happy. Um, I last saw him in Princeton in 2009 uh, with my family, and we went out for a meal with, and, and Siobhan was there already working on the book. Um, and I just, you know, I want to reflect that I learned a great deal about John, about all, from John about all sorts of things. You know, he would often pull me into that room across from his office and give me like an impromptu lecture for like an hour about something that he was on his mind. Um, and one other story about another way in which he touched my life. Uh, I went to a math meeting once to get Coxeter's autograph. 
okay so because he was quite old by then quite famous and i was like i get his autograph i brought a stack of like five of his books and uh i said while i was saying can i get your autograph i said oh i've been working with john conway at princeton on in his book and he cox got very excited he's like well i i, I really want to autograph a book for john conway and I said, um, oh, okay, okay. Uh, you know, he insisted, and I said, I didn't want to disappoint him, so I had to kind of decide on the spot which one of my books to present to Conway later. They were all mine, but I was like, okay, fine, I'll, I'll designate one and give it to him. And so uh, by the time I was done getting all these autographs, book sign, I start packing them away very elaborately in my backpack. Everyone else went off to dinner, and I, I was the last person in this room, except for one other student, and she came up and she introduced herself to me. And uh, that's how I met my wife. So, you know, there's one other way in which John touched my life. Um, two other very random things that come to mind while I was talking. Uh, somebody talked about acetate sheets. And I just remember one time he was giving a lecture and he needed to erase something. And he had to be real quick about it. And he just took it and he licked it. <laughs> he licked it off and cleaned it up. And uh, Don Knuth talked about Euler. And I remember him telling me that he was one of the few people who went and read all the old works. He, he respected the classical works. And he said he, he cut the pages, you know, he cut the pages of some of those Euler's like published works in Cambridge because, you know, no one had ever looked at them before. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm just so grateful. He taught me so much about how to look for mathematically interesting problems and situations where I didn't realize there might be any. And I'm grateful to have this opportunity to pay tribute to someone who's touched so many lives, including mine. Thank you. Joseph, can you hear me? You're, uh, yeah, we've unmuted you, sorry. You. Uh, it's yeah. me, Joe. Yeah, it's Joe Cohn. Yeah. Can you hear yeah. You're up. I can hear you, can you hear me? Yes, and we can see you too. Okay. You can see me, okay. So I just wanna make a few, say a few words here, uh, of course, John was a great friend of mine, and I could tell many, many anecdotes, but there were so many anecdotes already. Uh, so I, I'll just concentrate on one little topic, and that is the tremendous impact that John had in our department. So he came to, when I was a graduate student in Princeton, the uh, main center of activity was the common room. The graduate student didn't have offices, they were always hanging around the common room, and there was tea in the afternoon, and there, it was like a bazaar, tremendous excitement. People were playing games. There were professors, uh, stars, you know, art, like Arten, who would sit there sur literally surrounded with people sitting at their feet. And, and there was a kind of an atmosphere. And uh, of course, that was in the 50s. And then as the years went by, things sort of became more professional, more sedate, and more uh, somehow, the uh, uh, graduate student offices, there wasn't so much time, this, that. All of that changed dramatically when John Conway came. He's, he brought back the old spirit of, of games and of uh, uh, discussions and so on. And so he made a tremendous difference in, in the common room. Now, uh, he was also uh, very, uh, you know, he had this. Uh, Every visitor to Fine Hall would have to be shown uh, Conway's office because it's a spectacular thing where he had these wonderful uh, objects uh, that he made and uh, all kinds of polyhedra and, and uh, various things. And he had a tremendous uh, knowledge about all these things, not only mathematical, but also how they related to crystallography and chemistry and so on. So really got an education when you talk to him. And um, he had a sort of an audience uh, all, the, all day long where people would come up. Uh, he would usually sit in the car, in a, on a chair in a corridor and people would come up and have little seminars and sessions and there was always someone. And I was lucky enough, let's see if I can make it, uh, show this. I was lucky enough to take a picture of it and I don't know if I can, if you can see it. Let me hold it up, let me hold it up, uh, no. let, me, let me technically, give it a technical. Yeah, can you see it? So this is, I think I was lucky to catch him at, at a typical moment. Um, 
So um, I think for the sake of the length of the meeting, uh, of course, there are many, many anecdotes and meetings that we had, et cetera, et cetera, but some of which are written up in um, Siobhan's wonderful book. But um, I think I'll quit here and let the next speaker go. It's getting late. Thank you, Joe.